Hello and welcome to lecture number 7, in which I tell stories of war planes. We talk about correlation and regression, and we will get right into it. 1943. The Second World War is well underway, ravaging large parts of Europe. Military aircraft that had first entered the stage in World War I are now reaching their peak importance as they rain fire from the skies. But the Allied forces are facing a problem. As warplanes get better, so do anti-aircraft systems. In an effort to improve the survival of their fleet, the US military starts examining the planes returning from the skirmishes with the opposing forces. They characterize the pattern of bullet holes in the metal hull, meticulously noting down each hit that the plane sustained. The resulting picture is better summarized in the modern redrawn version that you can see here. We will look at it in just a second, but before we do, let me preface this one by stressing the reach of what we will find. The effect in question has an invisible hand in the laboratory results you create, in the advice people give, and is the reason why you don't get rich after reading books by people telling you how to get rich. It is the perv pervasive mechanism that powerful people often don't want to admit exists. So after taking a look at the data they gathered, the military is ready to rush into action. To improve the endurance of the aircraft, the plan is to reinforce the parts of the plane that were most often hit by bullets. With stronger wings and a sturdier body of the plane, they think surely more pilots will come back from their mission safely. They were wrong. But the pilots were in luck. The military also consulted with the statistics research group at Columbia University. A man named Abraham Walt lived there, or worked there. In his now unclassified report, a method of estimating plane vulnerability based on damage of survivors, he argues against the generals. Instead of the most hit parts, the least hit parts are to be reinforced. The reason for this seemingly counterintuitive result is what is known as survivorship bias. The data that was collected contained only survivors. Those planes that sustained damage not severe enough to hinder them from coming back from the mission. The aircraft that were hit in other places simply didn't make it back. Consequently, Walt advised to reinforce the engines and the fuel tanks. This is but one of a multitude of biases, specifically a selection bias, that will reinforce that will influence the quality of the inferences you can draw from the available data. Keep in mind, data is not objective and never exists in a vacuum. There is always context to consider. The way the data was collected is just one of them. A lot of these ideas seem obvious in hindsight, which incidentally is another bias that social psychologists call hindsight bias, but they can sometimes be hard to spot. A common saying, for example, is that music was better back in the days, or that all the old music still holds up while the new stuff on the radio just all sounds the same. Well, not quite. This is also survivorship bias at work. All the bad and forgettable songs of the past just faded into oblivion, never to be mentioned again, while the songs people generally agreed to be good survived the ravages of time unscathed. A similar thing happens with success in general, not just songs. If you ask any CEO high up the corporate ladder, a millionaire or the author of a book that reads How to Get Rich, they are sure to have a witty anecdote about how their persistence or their brilliance or their charisma brought them to where they are now. What we are not seeing is all the people just as witty, just as charismatic or even just as persistent that were simply not as lucky. Very few people will tell you this, because it takes a whole lot of courage to admit that one's success is based on luck and privilege. And to take it back to the scientific context, 
When you are planning an experiment for the lab, always ask whether the data collection process can in some way be biased towards what you are trying to show. This also extends to social media, so I leave you with this. Weird how every time you see this image on Twitter, it has a ton of retweets. This is also why all the people you follow on Twitter, for example, seem to have more followers than you do. Now, let's jump straight back into R. To ease back into our programming, let's look at some small but helpful things that might otherwise be missed on the sidelines. First up is the blue package. You can install it just like any other package in CRAN, so the normal install packages or RENV install will do. And then we load it using the library blue. And clue has basically just one function that is important to us right now. And this function is also called clue. I hope this doesn't confuse you. Let's run this line first. And now I can use clue. In here, we put in some text. Just any text, for example, one plus one. And now every time we have curly braces, whatever happens in these curly braces will be evaluated by R. So if we write one plus one equals one plus one, we get one plus one is two, which uh, is correct. Now, if we do the same thing, for example, by creating a variable first, let's say we have some p-value um, 0, 4, and now we type, we have a p-value, of and now curly braces and we put a value in here and maybe an exclamation mark afterwards and we get this complete sentence it's a bit nicer than using face we have and then value and then exclamation mark which also works just more cumbersome right and this feels more natural okay this was the clue package I wanted to mention, and I will use it today as well. And then there are SVGs, which stands for Scalable Vector Graphics. Um, and I briefly mentioned graphics devices last week, I think. So generally, they are those devices that produce pixel graphics, where the information is stored as color values of pixels. And these are called raster, uh, raster devices. A rack? which I showed you last week, provides some of them. When you zoom into a raster image, you can see things getting pixely or blurry. Another way to store information about graphs is to write a mathematical description of the lines and other shapes in the plot, which will then be interpreted by the program with which you open vector graphics. And one of the most popular of those is this scalable vector graphic format. Let's, um, create an SVG file ourselves. I'm going to create a plot that I call example. And, oh, I don't have the tidyverse loaded yet. Then I will do this in my setup chunk for now, because this means uh, it will automatically be loaded every time I open this document. Right. Um, just keep in mind, if you give someone the, uh, the document, they can't see your setup chunk because it's include false, unless you also have the a download button, for example, for the whole document. Actually, let me include this one now. So instead of HTML document, the normal one I want code download true. And now if I knit this, which oh I shouldn't work, this is not existent. And now if I knit this. And I can already keep typing while I do this. Um, we get this little download RMD button here, which enables people to download your source code. And it will be included in the HTML file. It's quite nice. So uh, we wanted to load the tidyverse to get, get ggplot tricks to create an example plot. So let's use ggplot on an example data set that is also included called Metcurse. 
and it contains information about the miles per gallon, the cylinders, the displacement, and so forth of some cars. So let's plot the displacement disk versus the miles per gallon, which I have no idea how much a mile is in a gallon, but should be fine. And then let's add some title. Let's look at the plot. Just a, a regular plot. And instead of just looking at it in here, I want to use gbsave. I want to save it in a folder called plots, which I already created. And I want to save it as example.svg. And gsave will automatically infer the correct graphics device from this file extension. If it doesn't, we could specify a device svg in here as well. But this is not necessary in this example. Now, if I run this, the plot will be saved. Dimension of 7x7. Seven seven. I look in here. I have my plots folder and I have this svg in here. svg is actually just a plain text format which um, tells the whoever is displaying it what shapes are in there. For example, here is a circle with center of x and center of y and radius. So these are our data points. And this means we look at it. Um, let's me, let me open this folder up in my, well, what would be the Explorer on Windows. And now in my, my picture viewer, Notice that if I zoom in here, it doesn't get pixely because the information is stored in a mathematical sense of there should be a point here and this is the radius, so there's no pixels to zoom into. And we could even open it with other applications, for example, Inkscape, which is a vector editor. Let's open it in some other place. Oh, here it is. Oh, one note, if you try to do this and you get uh, an error, like there's no package called SVG Lite, well, you just have to install the package SVG Lite. The disadvantage of SVGs is that they can be bigger than their comparable, uh, for example, PNG counterparts. I'm showing you SVGs specifically because it takes time to master all the intricacies of ggplot. For example, to create annotations and to change text and fonts and all that. Um, but I don't want to leave the impression that everything has to be done with PRR. Sure, from a reproducibility standpoint, being able to replicate all your plots and even the complete research report we are marked on at the press of a button is great. And this should be your ultimate goal, I think. But no one ever started out as an expert. And connecting with the tools that you already have, no, I think is an important step. So for example, I'm here in Inkscape and I can, for example, add some annotations by adding this ellipse here. Um, oh, Pac-Man, okay. But maybe you want to annotate some, some points in your plot and add some annotations and, and text. I want to also include a word of warning because when you do this, everything in here is part of the vector image, so there's nothing preventing you from changing the actual data. Um, you can add annotations and all that, which is great. But be very, very mindful of this. You can accidentally completely destroy your plot. So um, be extra, extra careful when you do this. Speaking of being careful, I don't want to save this. Uh, there's one rule I can give you to make your data analysis more secure. And this is your raw data is sacred. Do not ever modify it or save over it. This is even more important when, for example, using Microsoft Excel to preview, to preview a CSV file. And in no circumstances should you hit the Save button in Excel when you're looking at the raw data. Because, for example, approximately one-fifth of all genomic research papers contain errors in the gene lists because Excel converted genes such as ZEPT2, which stands for ZEPTIN2, into dates, September the 2nd. And this will then be stored as a number and everything breaks down. Biologists have since given up and renamed the genes that were commonly converted into dates by Excel, but point still stands. 
But this caution is of course also necessary when analyzing your data with R, not just Excel. When we read in the raw data and save a processed version, we create a new file or even better, a new folder for it. So a good convention for you would be to have a data for your uh, a folder for your raw data and then one for the data that is derived from this raw data to make sure you don't accidentally overwrite your raw data. The two things should be sacred, your raw data and your scripts, because if you have your raw data and your scripts, you can replicate all else and you can recreate your plots just using the raw data and the scripts. Moving on to covariance, correlation and regression. And I have this little XKCD comic in here. Check quite like, I really recommend XKCD. And we will be using a Star Wars dataset for this. But before we dive into the new Star Wars dataset, let's create some example data to get a feel for what we are dealing with first. I'm using normally distributed data because the normally distribution is so common. Let's create a data frame or tibble. And uh, because I'm lazy, I'm just calling it DF. There should probably be a better name for this. And X is going to be normally distributed. So R norm for random normally distributed. How many values do I want? I think I want to make this a variable so that I can use the same for X and Y. Let's use 50. And then just for the fun of it, let's make both of them a, bit, a different mean and standard deviation. So x will have a mean of 1 and y will have a mean of 3 and x will have a standard deviation of 0.8 and let's take 1.2 for y. All right, we have a bunch of points in 3D space. Let's create, uh, calculate their mean, the mean of x, the mean of b of x. When I'm lazy, I'm copying and pasting this down. Now we have the mean of x and y, and let's create a ggplot from this data frame where we have x on the x-axis and y on the y-axis. Not terribly creative, but it works. So we create a vertical line with the x-intercept to be the mean of x. Uh, let's make it a bit transparent. And Today I kind of like the color dark violet. Let's copy this down and we need an H line, a horizontal line. That's an Y intersect. Uh, same color, but no plus on the end. Actually, we do need a plus. Now we're adding a DM point. And we have these randomly distributed numbers. Let me move to the slides so I can show you some formula. So last week we talked about the variance, the measure of the spread of a random variable. Today we are extending this idea to two random variables, which in today's example are normally distributed. And we get this idea for two random variables x and y, but the covariance by taking the expected value of all differences of x to the expected value of x and y to the expected value of y. Expected value of something in this case is just a fancy way of saying the mean of x, the mean of y, and the mean of all those values. So if we assess the individual contribution of points towards the covariance, we can understand it quite intuitively. Point has a higher x than the mean of x. Here's the mean. So all these points here have a higher x than the mean of x and also a higher y than the mean of y. So this top right quadrant, they will have positive contribution towards the covariance. Likewise, all the points in the lower, the bottom left quadrant, they will have negative value here, 
negative value here. And so in total, it's positive. So they will contribute, contribute positively to the covariance. However, the values in the bottom right, top left corner, they will have negative contributions. Because one of those will be negative and the other will be positive in this example. If you have a mix of both positive and negative contributions, the overall mean, so the expected value, will be small absolute value. The covariance is one small problem. It will have very weird units, so x times y. x times y will be the unit of the covariance. And the scale is different depending on the random variables. So we can do what we can do is standardize it by dividing by both standard deviations there denoted by sigma in this formula. And then we get this correlation coefficient, which can assume values between minus one and one. So one would be a perfect correlation in the positive direction, minus one would be a perfect correlation in the negative direction. Its full name is Pearson product moment correlation coefficient, or Pearson's R, which in this case is not, not the programming language, but rather just a, a variable name. We can square it to get r squared, obviously, which indicates the strength of the correlation with the values between 0 and 1, independent of the direction. And we will meet it again later. Now, let's actually go back to r to meet our dataset. The Star Wars dataset is included in dplyr. So there's no need to download anything. If you have the was loaded, you have the Star Wars dataset. And it contains information about uh, 78 characters from Star Wars. Unfortunately, this data was collected a while ago, so there's no baby Yoda. Which in itself is quite sad, but maybe um, the other 78 characters can make up for that. And let's uh, calculate some correlations. So the first thing I want to do, and this will be under the heading of Pearson versus Spearman, which is uh, unfortunately not a boxing match. Maybe we should have statistics boxing matches. Um, and we can use it using the core function. And here we see the names popping up again. We have Pearson, Kendall, and Spearman. So core tests some, uh, runs some correlations. And uh, now that I see this, there's also cough or covariance. Um, but like I said, the correlation is probably more useful in a lot of cases. So it takes an X and a Y. So let's use Star Wars. And we want the height column, for example, and the mass column. At first, this will not work because some of these are in A. Here we go. Uh, Mon Mothma has no mass, so we don't, uh, we don't know the mass. But what we can say is use only complete observations. And this will just silently drop in A's if I type this correctly. And now we get a correlation of point. Uh, one, three, three, eight, something. There's another way we can calculate the same thing. Um, because core, if you look at the help page, can not only take an X and a Y, instead it can also take a matrix or a data frame as X. So in here, we could also say we want the core of Star Wars. Now, this would try to calculate the correlation for all columns with all other columns, which doesn't work because um, the columns must be numeric and we don't know what the correlation of skin color with the mass is, for example. No way to calculate correlation. Well, no, no straightforward way. There's probably some, some ways to turn these into numbers and then calculate a correlation, but it doesn't do this by, by default. So uh, let's get only the two columns that we are interested in, height and mass, and I'm using the base R syntax here for, for selecting columns. Sometimes it's just more straightforward to do it. And this 
will give us what you call a correlation matrix. What we can do with it to, to make it easier to work with it in the tidyverse is convert it to a tibble. No, not that. Tibble. So we get the correlation matrix and notice. Oh, and I forgot to use uh, complete observations. So let's do this in here as well. Now we're not getting an A anymore. So we're getting the, well, the correlation of height with itself should be one. We would be very surprised if it's otherwise. And for mass and height, we get the same correlation. There's one thing to, to notice here. The correlation coefficient is symmetrical. It doesn't care if it's the correlation of x and y or y and x. Uh, however, if we turn this into a tibble, what we use is these row names. Because tibbles don't have row names, they only have columns and names for the columns. However, we can say row names and specify in S tibble what the column, so we are turning the row names into a column, and here we are specifying the name of these of this new column. Let's call it feature one. And now we have the column which contains the previous row names. And let's get this into a tidy format. Not always necessary, but for this example, I want to make everything that is not feature one longer. This is what happens. And let's give a new name to the name column. Names2 is going to be feature2. And now we have a straightforward way for the value column to get its name and it's just going to be a core for correlation. And now we have the reciprocal correlations for both, each, for, for all features with each other. And I'm doing this because now it works better with ggplot and it makes it easier for me to create, well, basically a correlation matrix as a plot. So we have feature one and feature two on the x and y axis, and I'm using the fill depending on the correlation value. And I'm also using a label for this. So I'm adding a geom raster, which is the same as a geom tile. So it adds um, squares to our plot. However, a geom raster is faster when all the tiles are the same size. And I'm using a geom text to display the actual values. And oh, let's make this. Let's make it white. Now we have our correlation matrix. We can see the actual values. Maybe we would have wanted to round this down. And uh, you can use the color to see correlations quicker. Apart from four, <coughs> there's also, let's copy this down here. Hmm. There's also core.test, which gives us more information. We get this, this title that is here since product moment correlation, not just a number. This is the number down here. We got up, up there. Let's save it. So we can explore it a bit more. We can get individual elements out there. It behaves like a list. <coughs> we can also use from the prune package of the tidy models framework, which I showed you last week. We used it to do PCA. There's the tidy function that we also used earlier. And we can tidy this uh, test object. <clears throat> and now we get a nice representation. The estimate of the correlation, we get a p-value, and a bunch more information. When I first did this, I was a bit surprised that the correlation was so low. We are, all, we are after all, talking about height and mass, which I assume to be highly correlated. So let us look at the data points to see what is going on. Take the star data set, we use the ggplot, and we use the mass and the height on the x and y axis respectively. Now I'm adding geom point. 
Here we go. And okay, this here is a clear outlier. And this is what is drawing our correlation down because the rest seems to be pretty correlated. And let me actually copy some text and code from the script. Now this here is Jabba the Hutt. You might remember from the Star Wars films, really, really fat, fat guy. <laughs> um, and this is a clear, clear outlier. It's a massive outlier in all senses of the word massive. Luckily, there's another method for us to assess correlation, which is more robust to outliers. Well, of course, in, in this example, it might be acceptable to remove this outlier because it's clearly part of a different distribution. But I find removing outliers always a bit tricky. And in this case, there's a, a method to compute correlation coefficients, which is more robust to outliers. And I am talking about the Spearman method. Let's create the Spearman correlation coefficient. Again, we're using Star Wars, mass and Star Wars height. And now by typing method, Spearman, we're using the Spearman correlation. And we're only using the complete observations. Let's see how high this one is. Much, much higher. Let me copy and paste a bit of code to show you what is happening. So what the Spearman correlation does is instead of using the raw numbers of all the, uh, the points here, is turning them into ranks first. So the rank is if you sort all the numbers, what's their rank or their index? And now we get a much, much higher correlation. So visually, this is what happens. And all these outliers, for example, they don't have as much an effect because they're just the next rank. They are not, um, uh, as in here, a couple of thousand kilograms higher. All right, finally, linear regression is a related concept because both Correlation and linear regression quantify the strengths of a linear relationship. However, there are key differences. When we fit a linear model, like y dependent on a plus b times x, there's no error in x. We assume x is something that is fixed, like the temperature we set for an experiment, or the dosage that we used for an experiment. And y, on the other hand, is a random variable. In the covariance and correlation of x and y, both x and y are random variables. Just like in here, height um, and mass are both random variables. And this means that while the correlation coefficient and the yeah the correlation coefficient is symmetrical, we could swap these correlation coefficient would be the same. And also translation and scale invariant, so we can um, change the mean or the scale of, of uh, of our random variables, it wouldn't change the correlation coefficient. Linear models are not. Let's look at some other data that I have prepared to create a linear model. And it's also about Star Wars, but this time I downloaded some data about the Star Wars movies. And just to give you a bit of practice with different formats, I used the RDS format, which stands for R data. And there's Star Wars movies that RDS. And RDS can be quite handy because it's really fast to load and save. Sometimes faster than CSV file. Because it's, an, it's stored in a format that is native to R, so no, R knows how to handle it. We can also store dates, for example, easier because we don't have to encode them. Um, and what I want to look at is move over here. We have a rating for all these 10 movies. And what we also have is the year the movie was produced or came out. Let's fit a linear model. I will call it model because that seems like a good name for a model. 
And we want to fit the IMDB rating depending on the year. And as data, I want to get the Star Wars movie status set. Let's look at our model. And in here we see straight away, this is sort of the rating it starts at. And now for every year, for every year, the rating decreases by 0 0.03. Let's make this more visually appealing. And I will use another function from Broom to augment this model. What Broom Augment does is it takes the data the model originally got by while fitting it as these two variable variables we use for fitting, and it creates the fitted value and also the residuals, which I'll show you what these are in a second. So let's pipe this to ggplot. And I want to plot the year and the IMDB rating using uh, points, but before that I want to add the geom moves using method case lm, so I want to add this linear model. Let's make it a bit transparent. And let's also make it dark violet. And now we're adding the actual data points. This is what our plot currently looks like. And I wanted to show you what these residuals are. So let me add a geom segment. Now I'll copy and paste this because it's not terribly interesting. But we are adding these little lines, the segment which start at the year and the fitted point, and they end at the year. Still the same, so it's vertical, but they end at the y position for the actual rating. So these are the residuals, the distances of the line to the actual data points. And they are, in fact, what makes linear regression work. Because its full name is ordinary least squares. And the squares in question are the squares of these residuals and least. And least squares indicate that these are to be minimized. I am yet to encounter extraordinary least squares, but I'm sure someone in machine learning will soon need more words to fuel the hype and it will become a thing. So this is ordinary least squares. Uh, let's look at our model using room again. Tidy up our model. Here we get the contribution of year. For each new year, lowers the expected rating by 0 0.03. And the intercept at 75. As for, as, at first, this really high intercept seems weird, but this is just what the model would expect to be at the year zero. And the model doesn't know that INDB ratings can go only up to 10. So you wouldn't try to extrapolate this model to backwards. Just because of common sense telling it it's not possible. There's another thing we can look at using the normal R summary function, not to be confused with GBLIS summarize. And I still sometimes do this. This is the summary of the model. And in here, we see this multiple R squared. And this R squared is the same R squared we would get if we took the correlation of the, of the Star Wars movies data set. Actually, where am I? Yeah, Star Wars movies and IMDb rating. 
and squared it. So this here is the same value. And the way to interpret this is r squared is the fraction of the variance of the response variable, which in this case, the rating is the response variable. So we have the fraction of the variance, variance in the response variable that can be explained by the predictor x. And in this case, the air is our predictor. We are able to explain 40% of the variance of the IMDb rating using the year. And the rest is variance from other sources. So far, we only dealt properly with linear relationships, and now it's time to get nonlinear. We will be creating a mechanistically driven predictive model. So we have a formula of which we want to adjust the parameters so that it fits our data. And let's take the classical Michaelitz Menten kinetics. There's a data set for enzyme kinetics included in R as well. It's called Euromycin. And if you look at the help page, you can also find out more about where it is from and the citations. Let's create it as a table. So that makes it easier to work with for us. It just prints nice as well. There's a couple of more things I want to do. Because for every concentration, we get the initial rate of the enzymatic. Um, so this is the concentration of uh, the substrate. And then the, we get the initial velocity of the reaction, of the enzymatic reaction, for treated and untreated cells. So treated with pyromycin and then the control. But we have every concentration and stage twice, so we have replicates. And let's make this explicit by adding a column for which replicate we are talking about. We group by the concentration and the state. Oops. And then we try to not delete our whole document. And then we mutate. So we add a new column. Uh, let's call it rep for replicate. And this is just going to be 1, 2, n. This function n will always be the size of the group it is in. So 2. However, it's not true in all cases because uh, we only have 20, um, 23 rows, so one of those is missing a replica. But it shouldn't bother us too much today. Let's give this a new name. Being lazy again, let's call it Bureau and create a plot from it. We want the concentration and the rate on X and Y, and let's color it by the state. And let's add some lines and some points. And there's something weird going on. We are connecting the within the replicates, but we want individual lines per replicate. Maybe we still want the color to be only dependent on the state. So let's set the group of the lines to be the combination of state and rep. Now this is what we get. From our biochemistry studies, we might remember that we can express this relationship through the michael menten formula. So the rate is dependent. Let me actually just turn this into um, a function straight away. So we make rate a function of the concentration but also of the maximum velocity, Vm, and the k value, so the Michaelis Menten constant. Could have also called it km, stick with k for now. So what we do is we take a Vmax, multiply it by the concentration, and then divide by the k times k times the concentration. And now we can calculate this for any numbers that we choose. Okay, let's um, pick some arbitrary starting values and see if we can match these in here. 
let me move this point, this plot down. So the definition of the function happens first, and then we can use it in the plot. Let's add geom function. And what I want to try, uh, try I have is fun being, well, I want this rate, um, but unfortunately, rate takes more than one argument. And geom fun, geom function can only take function that only take one argument. However, we can remember lambda functions where we create this anonymous function on the fly. So we use lambda rate or tilde in this case. So concentration is going to be this argument that our function takes, and the rest we just fix at some values for now. Let's just use vm of 200. And k, if we remember, k is the velocity, or uh, the concentration at which the half maximum velocity is reached. So let's use point. Let's use point one. It doesn't have to be too accurate. We're just um, testing where this lays for now. And I think something has gone terribly wrong. And I found it. I accidentally typed a time symbol here, but it should be plus. All right, and now we shouldn't get these astronomically higher values, and, and we want this to be better distinguishable. Let's make it black for now. And this is our, our curve, which is not yet fitted. I think we can do better than guessing, and we can use R for this. And what we will use is nonlinear least squares, which does a similar thing to what linear least squares does, we are trying to minimize the distance of our curve to the data points. So we need to, to do this once for treated and once for untreated. We get two curves. So let's create a model. And we use NLS for nonlinear least squares. First argument is a formula. So formula we create, we want the rate, depending on now this one is our function. So this rate means the variable, the feature rate in here. And maybe I could have named this function better, like calculate rate or something. Um, depending on the concentration, which we're just gonna call concentration for now. Um, and then Vm, okay. And actually, let's just put this all in here to concentration Vm and K as the data. It's going to use the pre row data set. And NLS, if I open up the help patch here, it also takes this subset argument, which is quite nice. Subset allows us to specify something just like we would in dplyr's filter work. So we can say we only want the subset of the data where the state is equal to treated, for example. Now this will not work, because we need to specify the starting values as a list. And this list needs to contain a value for everything that is not the feature in here. So concentration is feature, we don't need a spot, spot starting value for this. We don't need to estimate it. We're getting it from the data. Same for rate, but VM, VM and K, we need to specify some starting values. They don't need to be perfect. This is the job of the model to find the correct values. And here it worked. However, if they are like really far off, actually if this worked as well, okay. Um, Maybe it's if you do negative. No, it still finds it. Okay. Ah, okay. So if for example k is really far off, we get error in NLS, singular gradient. This means the value is so far off that we model no idea how to improve the parameters in which direction to go to make the model fit better. For this special case, I should mention 
There's also some self-starting models. Um, for Michaelis men genetics, they have SS MIGMEN, <coughs> which I'm not going into today. But for this, you wouldn't have to specify the starting values because it can estimate it from the data. But I think it's much more useful to learn the general case where, you can, where we can just fit any function to our data that we want. There are now multiple ways of displaying our models, so let's go through some of them. So first things, let's take the room package and use the augment function. Augment takes the data that went in, rate and concentration, and gives us the fitted value and the residuals. So everything, the difference between the fitted and the actual value. We can use this to get TGBlot to display it using concentration and rate on the x and y axis, and then let's use geom point and geom line. And in geom line, we are going to give it a different aesthetic for y. So we are giving geom line the dot fitted. So we have our points and the fitted line. Notice, however, um, the disadvantage here is we are only getting points and things in the line where we had data points originally, even though we already calculated. Let's look at the model again. Even though we could create a smooth function because we have these param parameters, we have the estimates for the parameters, so we could just put them into the function and get a, a value for every point that we so please. So we could take this out, copy and paste or something, but copy and pasting is not fun, not reproducible in this case. So um, let's check out the predict function, which is just from base R. It takes a model. If we don't give it anything else, it gives us the predicted values, which in the broom version here was <coughs> the dot fitted column. We get the predicted values, but we can also give it new data. So we give the list, and this list needs to contain the original variables that were used as predictors. So it's counts or concentration. And let's say one, um, zero, for example, or let's use one. So we get predictions. We can put any number of values in here. So let's do this in a table. Let's call it new, or let's call it predictions. So predictions is a table of concentration, which is just going to be a sequence from zero to one by steps of 0 0.01. So a bunch of evenly, evenly spaced numbers, and for each of them, we are going to predict the rate using the model. So new data is going to be a list where concentration is just the concentration in the table. And now we can use this in our data set. Uh, let's use the pure data set and let's only look at the uh, the state that we filtered so far, uh, that we fitted so far, which was only the treated ones. So we're using ggplot, using concentration and rate. And we are adding a geom point again. And this time we are adding a geom line where the data comes from the predictions. And this gives us the same pictures up here, but we have more points. It looks smoother. The line is smoother. I just noticed we could have even made it longer because we didn't go up to this higher concentration. And we can make it as long as we want.
we can also use this in combination with a geom function. Let's look at this. Because I think it feels quite natural once you get your head around it. So we're using the Puro dataset, and this time I'm just copy and pasting this part. And instead of adding the line, we just start with the points. Let's add a geom function. And in here, we are creating a function on the fly using the lambda syntax. And this function is going to be just predict using the model. And as a new data, the new data, the list where concentration is equal to dot x, which uh, will be the concentration. And geom function automatically creates this grid of evenly spaced numbers, which we did manually up here. And then we get a smooth function. And I think this approach feels quite natural. Now, what if we wanted to fit the model for both states, treated and untreated? We can resort back to our trusty error package. Now, let's call it pure models. And we are doing the same steps we did up there, except we are doing it on both things at the same time. So we are nesting. Um, by every, nesting everything that is not the state. Actually, let me uncomment this so we can look at it as we go. And now we are running mutate and we are creating a model, which is going to be, we map the function, and we map over the data and we're using the function that we are creating on the fly, NLS, where we have rate dependent on the rate of concentration, Vm and k. We mean data, and now data is going to be dot x, which will be this table in here in both of the two iterations when map goes around. And NLS also needs some starting values. So let's just give it starting values we use earlier as well. <clears throat> now we get two models, and we can keep working with those by getting a tidy representation of the models, by mapping over the, no, over the model, not the data. And we're using, doing tidy for this. At this point, I should have properly loaded the broom package using library broom, but now I'm sticking with it. And we can also get a glance of the model. Let's do this. Using Groom glance. And let's save this in this variable, which are prepared up here. We're getting a warning, but it still worked. I might have to figure out this warning later on. But now it's working. And now we can use unnest. To look for some at the tidy representation, and we get the estimates for the two terms for both states. We can use the same to unnest glance, <coughs> and glance tells us something about how the model performed, but I don't have the time to go into these measures for now. Now we could use the parameters that we got, got from Tidy, these here, to plot the curves now. We could also use the predict function with these models by either pulling them out first um, or running it in, in a map function. Um, but there is an easier way for this and this is just fitting the model straight in ggplot. So let's plot the concentration and the rate again. At this point, we have done it quite a lot. So let's quickly write down color depending on the state. And now we add a geom point. And we also add a geom smooth. And instead of adding 
linear model or this locally estimated smoothing, what we say is method is, and this can basically be any fitting function, NLS. Now we need some more arguments to our fitting function. The formula for our fitting function. And this can be a bit confusing because inside of GM Smooth, this formula also always needs to be y dependent on something of x. Some way we need y on the left side and x on the right side, which is different to what we had up here, where we set rate dependent on concentration. So um, in NLS, we talk about the actual features. In GeoSmooth, we always had, have to call the predicted value y and the predictor x. So let's take this thing and formulate it in terms of y and x. We're using the rate where the concentration x, then we have some vm and some k. And furthermore, this method NLS takes more arguments, so we need to use the method dot arcs um, argument of GM smooth, which doesn't appear in the auto completion, but I can assure you it's here. Method arcs, which is a list of additional arguments passed on to the modeling function defined by a method. So method dodge arcs takes a list, and in this list there is start, which is again another list. Where we say VM is it's 200 something and K is 0 0.1 something. And now if we run this, I'm thinking we should get an error. Yeah, computation failed. And the reason for this. As by default, GM Smooth tries to plot these confidence intervals, which we had earlier for linear models. However, NLS does not report these confidence intervals. So what we need to say is SE equals false anytime we have a model that doesn't have a confidence interval. And now we get our fiddle lines. The unfortunate thing about this method is that we end up fitting the model twice once to get the actual models and parameters ourselves, and then a second time in ggplot to display it. Um, but in most cases, this is not a problem because the model is not very computationally expensive. This is all I have for today. I look forward to what you do in the exercises. And I'll see you uh, next week. Oh, also, um, a little note on the exercises. Uh, today are going to be the last regular exercises last week and uh, the last week on the eighth lecture i will do like an example data analysis where we explore some more advanced concepts i'm still open to suggestions as to what data set we should explore there and i will showcase some cool things maybe we are building an app maybe we are building a website um, maybe we are exploring some advanced statistics or machine learning um, whatever fits the data set that you can choose. And I will send around a survey for this. And there will be no regular exercises for the last sort of Christmas specially lecture. There's only one thing uh, which we'll have in the last uh, lecture. And then this is me asking for feedback. So you can either provide this anonymously or just send me a message on the uh, Discord channel. So I'll see you on Friday.